And welcome again to another Wednesday night Bible study as we spend time studying about the churches of Galatia. Now, last week we had uh, spent some time there and we talked about the origin of the, of the city. We talked about some of the background of the city, some of the idolatry and various things that were uh, around in that area. We learned that the churches, we, well, back up, we learned that Galatia itself was not one town or whatever, but actually a, a region there within Asia Minor, today known as modern-day Turkey, but Asia Minor in that area. And so there were several uh, cities in that area, four of which we know about for sure, and that was Iconium, Lystra, Derby, and Antioch in Pisidia. And we are going to spend some time in Acts chapter 13 and 14 especially, and also a little bit in Acts chapter 18. But this is where uh, Paul comes in and he begins his preaching and such uh, there in that area. Now, uh, keeping in mind what's happened from Acts chapter 11, Acts chapter 11, Paul's with Barnabas, and he's there in Antioch, Antioch in Syria, which is, again, a different town. We studied that last week. That's a different town, but Antioch in Syria, and they were there. That's where the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch, Antioch in Syria, Acts eleven twenty six. Well, in the meantime now, we're going to see how the uh, Paul and Barnabas did that work, and they were very successful there and helped the brethren much and encouraged them and so forth. And then from there, we're going to see them uh, leave and go, um, well, start over in Galatians, such as we discussed uh, earlier. In Acts chapter 13, you'll see this, that their, uh, Paul's first journey uh, and going with Barnabas was something that was set up by the church at Jerusalem, really. And the church of Jerusalem wanted them to go and wanted them to, to serve and wanted them to, uh, you know, do and, and follow what God had said, obviously. They wanted uh, them to go and to preach and go as far as they could. Well, if you look there, the Bible says there was a, at the church at Antioch certain prophets and teachers and such. And it talks about Barnabas, Simon, uh, Lucius, uh, Manaean, and he talks about Herod, the te uh, I'm sorry, he, Manan was brought up with Herod and then Saul. And talks about how they ministered and fasted and so forth. And how, and uh, just one, one thing here then, he says they'd fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them and they were sent forth, departing to Seleucia, he says, and then sailing to Cyprus. Well, and so one little correction we'll make, he did start at Antioch. Originally from Jerusalem to Antioch, from Antioch, now Acts 13, he's going to go uh, off from there. And so I stand corrected. But as you look here in Acts chapter 13, it says that they'd gone from Antioch, Seleucia, and over to Cyprus. And if you remember from some of our past studies and some of our past uh, readings and things, we found that Antioch, uh, of course, was, was inland. Antioch and Syria was inland. Seleucia was more toward the coast. And so there was a connection that, that these two cities had with one another so far as a, a town on the coast and then trading then with Antioch and so forth. And from Seleucia to island of Cyprus. And of course, Cyprus is still with us today. It still exists. And Cyprus was there and called Cyprus here in Bible days. And then from Cyprus is going to leave and then begin his journey uh, the Bible talks about going into, uh, he, as far as Seleucia, it says they came to Paphos and again, finally coming down into this place of Antioch in Pisidia, Acts 13 and verse number 14. And like I said, that's where we're going to spend the majority of our time is thinking about and, and reading about this church at um, the church at, at Antioch and Pisidia, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby, those four churches. And so if by this time, I hope that you've been able to get your Bibles out. If you want to take any notes, feel free to take any notes. And of course, you can contact me anytime. You can go right here to CaneyvilleChurchOfChrist.com. Feel free to uh, you know, look that up. Feel free to write to me. Uh, send emails or messages or whatever you'd like to do. We'd love to hear from you. and love certainly to talk to you about things of a spiritual nature. I want to, before we begin, I want to have a word of prayer. And then we'll begin this study in earnest. 
Father in heaven, we're so thankful to thee for this day. We're so thankful for the opportunity we have to study, to learn from thy word. We're so thankful that we can uh, have this uh, ability, that we have the technology that allows such studies to take place. We're so thankful for thy word, for the truth, for the fact that we can learn about uh, Paul and Barnabas and learn about the things that they did in this place of Galatia. Pray we'll take the things that we study, that we will learn, and that we will make applications to ourselves. We'll realize and understand that this Bible is worthy of our study and it is worthy of our application every day. So please help us with these things. And so thankful for Jesus and his great sacrifice. And so thankful for thy love. So thankful for the truth. So thankful we can have salvation. When we come to thee and follow thy plan of salvation, we know that we can receive that wonderful forgiveness. I'm so thankful for all the many blessings. Please be with those that are sick. Please be with those bereaved or lost of loved ones that you'll give them comfort and, and strength in these days. That's all these things. In the name of thy son, Jesus, and amen. Now, as we begin, like I said, look in Acts chapter 13, and there we find uh, the beginning, of course, of uh, this uh, situation, the beginning of, uh, well, really, where uh, the people came and began their work at Galatia. And so, uh, if you will, turn with me over there to Acts chapter 13 and 14, and you'll see that's where all this begins. In Acts chapter 13, and, and we st we started in verse number 14. The Bible says, When they departed from Perga, he says they came to Antioch and Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after, uh, verse 15, reading the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue said to them, Ye men and brethren, if you have any word or exhortation for the people, say on. Then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand said, Men of Israel, and you that fear God, give audience. And here he begins preaching about, uh, actually starts in the Old Testament, and then from the Old Testament leads him right up to the point of Christ, of his death and his burial and his resurrection. And he makes it very, very clear that this, that this Jesus is the fulfillment of all these prophecies that we have studied, and, and of course they had studied for so many years. And it's just an amazing thing when you look and see Paul and see him uh, and read that section and see all that was involved uh, so far as God's plan to get people here. Just look over there with me, if you will. Let's look over in the, in the book of Acts for a moment. Now, we were, we were talking here a moment ago about this. Let's scroll down here and get where we need to be. He says here that after he had beckoned with his hands, he says, the God of this people of Israel chose our fathers. So God chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with a high arm brought he them out of it. And so, again, like I was saying, where he starts is back at the captivity. That's where he begins is the captivity of the people and how God brought them out and how they had suffered for 40 years in the wilderness and finally came to the land of Canaan, verse 19. And he says, after this, he says, God made judges about the space of uh, 450 years till Samuel the prophet. And then talks about after verse 21, after they desired a king, what happened? Well, after they desired a king, he says, God gave them this uh, Saul, the son of Sis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin by the space of 40 years. And he ruled him, raised up David, verse 22. And so you see how that God's plan was coming into effect. And notice how, how we've talked about being freed from Egypt, wilderness wanderings. They're in Canaan. They had judges. And now he's talked about these kings, Saul first, then David. And of this man's seed and this is Acts chapter 13 and verse number 23 of this man's seed hath God according to his promise raised unto Israel a savior Jesus now right there would have got their attention it would have got their attention because you know they're all they're all about the Messiah coming 
They're all about that. That's what the Jews had been talking about, discussing, preaching. They've been talking about this for 1,500 years. And so we know that one's going to come from the seed of David. We know the Messiah is coming. We know we're sure of this. God's promised it and so forth. And so Paul now preaches to them and tells them, listen, folks, he has already come. This one, uh, he says, came and he's uh, of the seed of David, according to the promise, he says he raised up a savior named Jesus. Now, when John first preached before of his coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, he said, but John, verse number 25, fulfilled his course. And he said, whom do you think that I am? He said, I'm not he, but behold, there one comes one after me whose shoes of his feet I'm not worthy to lose. Well, that's exactly what had been said in John chapter 3, you remember. When the people came to him, he was out in the wilderness baptizing folks, John was. And he'd been at Jordan, he'd been at Enon, that was near the town of Salem. And he's been different places uh, preaching and baptizing folks. And they were like, hey, are you the Messiah? You're the one. You preach this you know, this preaching of repentance and so forth, you must be the Messiah. He says, no, I'm not worthy to even unloosen his shoelace. It's not me. He said, I am the one, I'm the, the, the friend of the groom. This is in John chapter three, but Paul is using this same language right here. Acts 13, verse 25. And so he says, that John was saying, you know, I'm the friend. It's kind of like saying I'm the best man. He says, but the groom is coming. And he said, he's on his way. And of course, that's Jesus. He is the groom. The church is his bride. And now continue on. Many brethren, verse 26. Many brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. You need not. Now right there would have got their attention. Children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever fears God, to you is this word of salvation sent. So the word of salvation is not just to the Jewish people. It was to anyone who'd listen. Now we're going to start with the Jews, and Jesus did. But we're not going to just stay with the Jews. He said we're going to expand out as many people as we can go, as many people as we can find to teach them about this word of salvation. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they fulfilled them in condemning him. Boy, isn't that a charge? That's a serious charge. Look there in verse 27. He says that they that dwell in Jerusalem, their rulers, because they didn't even know him, nor yet the voices of the prophets. Well, pray tell what have these people been reading and listening to all these years if they didn't know the voices of the prophets. Now, folks, if that is not a slam, if that's not a condemnation of a group of people, I don't know what it is. These are the ones supposed to know God's word, supposed to be aware of what he says and looking forward to the prophecy. And they didn't have any idea any more than the man in the moon about Jesus coming. That's what he's saying. They didn't know Christ. They didn't know the voice of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day. They weren't paying attention. And right about here is where we stop and say, listen, that is a warning to me and it's a warning to you are you listening to what you are reading are you well but just back up are you even spending time in god's book how much time do you spend in god's book really and now are you listening to what you read when you do read are you because folks that's that's a serious matter right there are we listening to what's being said? Are we paying attention to the truth of God's word or not? Here's people weren't doing it. And Jesus came in on the scene, walked in there amongst them, and those people didn't even recognize him. And those that did recognize him didn't like him. He said, he did. he's not what we expected. He's not what we wanted. And so, you know, you're out of here. We don't want you. That's... Uh, 
just a sweeping condemnation, but very much deserved. Go on. He said, they found no cause of death in him, yet they desired Pilate, uh, Pilate that he should be slain. They couldn't find anything wrong with him. There was no reason to kill Jesus, but they tried, tried to figure out how to do it. So, Pilate, you need to kill him. When they'd fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in the sepulcher. But God, verse 30, I'm down to verse 30, see it? But God raised him from the dead. How about that? God raised him from the dead, friends. How about that? Now, that's going to get some people's attention as well. And we've talked about this in, in previous lessons, but it bears repeating now that amongst the Greeks and amongst those, uh, quote, Gentiles, and I mean, that's in the Jewish mind, if you weren't a Jew, you were a Gentile. So just amongst the Greeks, the Gentiles, whatever, amongst those people, the idea of a, of a resurrection at all was just, they, you know, that's just crazy talk. Now, nobody's resurrected from the dead. That has happened to anybody. And here's uh, Saul, Paul, saying, yes, God raised him from the dead. And so he's getting people, you might say, he, he's, he's getting uh, the attention of, of uh, both groups, Jews and Gentiles, because there were some, some Gentiles hanging around that synagogue that day. And I'll show you this in a moment. But, and we've already seen it, but we'll see it again toward the end of this chapter. So there's Jews and Gentiles there. They're listening to this. And so Paul has said something that, uh, <laughs> I mean, he was equal opportunity. He has upset the Jews, talking about how they didn't even know what they was reading. And now he's upset the Gentiles, saying, by the way, uh, God raised him up. You know that thing that you don't believe can happen? God did it. God raised him from the dead. And so now you've got both sides of the coin. And again, uh, somebody that's uh, uh, equal opportunity at, at, at upsetting people, he did a real good job. He's, he, he potentially makes both groups mad. But what it does is it challenges their taboos for sure. And so he was seen in many days of them, verse 31. And he came up from Galilee to Jerusalem, where, I say who, are his witnesses uh, unto the people. And we declare to you glad tidings, See, we declare unto you glad tidings how that the promise was made unto the fathers. God hath fulfilled, he said, the same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, and it, it, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. As concerning that he raised him from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, verse 34, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he saith in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thy holy one to see corruption. For David, after he served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid to his fathers and saw corruption. Does this sound familiar to anybody? He is, he is uh, you might say, dialing in on something that Peter had preached in Acts chapter 2. David is both dead and buried and his sepulcher is with us to this day. You want to know the difference between David and Christ and know that what was said in the Psalms was said about Christ? He said, David is dead and buried and the sepulcher is with us to this day. That's what Peter said. What the apostle Paul has said, David, he says, after he served his generation, fell asleep, fell on sleep and was laid under his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. None. No corruption. See that? Be it known to you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Not David. See? And now, now the Jews are going to understand something. I'm not talking about David. I'm not talking about uh, you know Isaiah or Moses or any of those other guys. I'm not talking about that. Through this one that God has raised from the dead and doesn't see corruption, through him, he says, is preached to you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which he said you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken by the prophets. And he quotes here uh, once more from the Old Testament. 
about, uh, Behold, you despisers and wonders and perish, for I work a work in the days, in your days, a work which you shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it to you. And when the Jews, now, now, stop right there. Now, this is pretty much the end of the sermon. The next verse, and I know there's not a lot of demarcation here, but, un, but when you read this uh, yourself, please read it. And when you do, you'll see this is a, a, a breaking point. When the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, all right, the Jews left. We've had enough. We don't want to hear anything else. The Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. And that's verse number 42. And so remember what I promised you a moment ago. I said I'd show you again where that there were Gentiles present in this synagogue that they were standing around and, or whatever. They were there present and hearing all this. It wasn't just Jews. It was a lot of Jews in there, but there were some Gentiles too. And so that's why I said when, when he says and, and speaks about a resurrection from the dead, well, you know, that's... <laughs> You know, to the Gentiles, to the Greeks, you know, that's crazy talk. And so, but he had also said a lot to the Jews, didn't he? Now, having said all these things, he says, they besought, they begged him, would you please preach this again next week? I always thought that was interesting, that here's someone who preaches a sermon, he gets done with the sermon, and they're like, would you do that again? <laughs> Would you preach that again? We need to hear it another time. And he agreed to it. And uh, we'll see this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause right here so we can get to some of our chart. But I want you to understand that was going on at that time. Okay? And so back again uh, over here to our chart. When we're talking about uh, the churches of Galatia and so forth. And we've read a lengthy section of Acts 13. I haven't got to 14 yet. We're still in... Uh, Antioch and Pisidia. But I want you to notice the origin of this church. We also notice here that Paul began his preaching, and we've already noticed this. Uh, where did he begin his preaching at, at Antioch? Well, where was that? Well, you've already seen it, haven't you? We've, been, we've spent a large section of Acts chapter 13, yes, in the synagogue. He was there in the synagogue in that place, and, of course, why was he there? And I don't have this on the chart, but I'll ask you. Why was he there? What purpose does it serve to go to the synagogue? Well, hopefully we understand that, that the reason why we would go to the synagogue is because we are trying to uh, get as many people as possible, to get as many people to listen as he could. And as I've shown you here in already going to the synagogue you would have had access to you know the jews obviously but you also had access to gentiles and notice how he even when he prefaced his words earlier on in the book of acts 13 those of the seed of abraham and you that fear god when he said those things you say well the seed of abraham fears god yes i agree but he's making a distinction between people who are the seed of Abraham, the people who are, you know, uh, Jews versus the Gentiles. And so it's you, but you who fear God. And so by the end of the, the passage or in the section we've read, we see again where the Gentiles, they've been amazed by this. And they're like, we need to hear some more of that. Would you come back next week and preach to us again? And of course, he's going to agree to do that. So there they were in the synagogue. But Paul was not there. Uh, let me back up. Paul was not there in the synagogue because he was uh, worshiping, quote unquote. He was not there to, quote, keep the law of Moses. That's not why he was there. He wasn't there for those purposes. He was there because that's where the people were. And he waited until the proper time, as we read. And it says, if anyone has a word of exhortation, why well, say on. And he said, yeah, I have something. And he took his opportunity. To preach. He took his opportunity to speak to these people. But he wasn't there because he was worshiping God or, or some, uh, some type of thing where he was trying to keep the old law or something where he was somehow still caught up with the law of Moses. That was done away, folks. That was done, gone, and over with. And now it's time to serve 
and worship God in the spirit and the truth. It's time, you know, to, to keep with uh, what's taught in Acts chapter 2 and so forth. But he's going here on the Sabbath day, Saturday, if you will. Seventh day is what? Sa Sabbath just means seventh. Okay, so seventh. So on the Sabbath day, seventh day, he's there to preach. Now, what did Paul do to convince the people to stop living by the law of Moses and to live for Christ? What was he doing? And it's all through that section that we spent time in. Do you remember? Yeah, what has he been doing? He, what's he doing to convince the people? Yes, he goes back to the old law and shows that old law. He started with them leaving Egypt and goes to the old law through to David and said, here is the seed of David. You need to stop the old law. You need to live for Christ because he says, uh, you need to uh, do that which is spoken by the prophets. He used the Old Testament narrative, you might say, the, the story or whatever that, that shows the, the lineage to Christ. He uses the prophets and kind of chides the, the Jews. He said, here's these people, they wouldn't, even, they wouldn't listen to the voice of the prophets. You need to listen to the voice of the prophets. And then uh, here even in this situation, goes back and says that, you know, you need to be, basically you need to be following this. You need to be doing this. And it was convincing to the Gentiles as you noted, they're like, we want to hear that. Would you come back, please? Would you tell us some more? Would you preach this again? We want to hear about this. And so, sure enough, the next Sabbath day, and we'll get there in a moment, but the next Sabbath day, oh my, everybody in town was there. And so who believed Paul? I think you already know. We've already talked about it. Who believed Paul? Well, it's evident what who's believe who has believed Paul is really more so the Gentiles, hasn't it? The Gentiles seem more in line to believe him than even the Jews, because by the time Paul's preaching all this, the Jews got up and left. Acts thirteen verse forty two. They got up and left. And here's the Gentiles. Hmm. Isn't it interesting? And very sad too, but the people that have been had the most access to God's word, let's say that say it that way, they've had the most access. Of course, God's word was inspired, and so here's Moses preaching it and the different prophets. And so they have all kinds of opportunities the Jews do. And yet when the time comes Who's believing? It's actually not the Jews. It's actually the Gentile people. The ones that are so bad, so awful. Oh my, they're terrible people, you know. And they're, the, they're just the scum of the earth as far as the Jews were concerned. But when you look at this, you're going, wait a minute. It seems like they're, you know, getting better and better because <laughs> at least they listen. At least they pay attention. They believe, Paul. They believe the words that were being used, and that's the point. And of course, we can continue to read from Acts chapter 13, and, and like I said, they did come back together. The whole city came out, verse 44 says, and they came out, and but when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy, and they spoke against those people, and contradicted, and blasphemed, and oh, it was a sight. It was just it was just a big hoorah out there. It's just just terrible what they had done, and and you'll pardon my uh, uh, countryfied English, I guess, but it was just a mess. And they saw the multitudes, but Paul and Barnabas waxed bold, and they said, "Listen, we need to come to you. I'm going to tell you what. Uh, if you're going to be like this, then we're going to turn to the Gentiles." They shook the dust off their feet. It says. And then they went to this place called Iconium. Which I already answered that question for. Now we're in Acts chapter 14. And so if you turn your attention over to Acts chapter 14 with me, 
uh, you'll see something very interesting, I believe. Now, just like we see here, they come in, they left Antioch, and there were some people that believed. There's no question about that. There was those who believed. There was folks who were baptized. They did, but it was a, it was just a, you know, a mess there <laughs> for a while at least. It was a mess because uh, he had. The, the people, the Jews, were so mad and so upset over all this. And it's like they wouldn't even believe their own teaching. And folks, let me just tell you something. Right here is God's Word. And I know I've got it, oops, I've got it over here on the screen. And I know I've got it over here, and I know you can, you can read along with me, and that's great. But I hope that every one of you have a Bible in your house. And I hope that all that's watching, We'll take that Bible and we'll read it for yourself. Now, I'm going to try to do my best to teach you. I'm going to do my best to instruct you in the best way that I know how to do it. But I think it's been made abundantly clear, if you've followed any of these programs, that I am human and I am capable of error. And I'm capable of making mistakes. And I'm capable of making slip-ups. And I don't mean to do it. And I don't try to do it. And uh, But men make mistakes, don't they? And they do things they wish that they hadn't done. But I tell you who is always right, and that's God. My word, I can write my word on a piece of paper. I could, I could write a book. And, and when I do, that book will still be written by man's hands and, and it's man's ideas. And so there's things in there that might be wrong or contradictory. You know what? But here is a book. Here is the written truth. That is not contradictory. It is not uh, somehow filled with error or wrong or anything like that. God's word is truth, John seventeen seventeen, And that's what we need to listen to. And so whenever Paul came to town in Antioch, it was great that he did. We appreciate what he did. He did a good job with what he did. But you know what he had to do? Or what the people had to do, rather, was listen to God's word. And a little later on in Acts 17, you'll see some folks commended because they listened to God and they weren't listening. And in, in that sense, they didn't place Paul on some high pedestal up here that he couldn't be touched. They searched the scriptures daily to see what, whether, what Paul was saying, to see what he was saying was so. Acts 17, verse 11. And so I've said all that to say this. There were people listening in Antioch and now as Paul goes through to other places, they're going to be listening as well. But the key point is, not that they listen to Paul's word, but that they listen to the inspired word of God that Paul was speaking. And of course, that we have today in written form. But he says here in Acts chapter 14, he says that at Iconium, he said, when they were come together, they went together in the synagogue and spake, and there's a great multitude of the Jews and also the Greeks, kind of like Antioch was, kind of starting in the same way, aren't we? Had this, had this place, a uh, synagogue, ha and going there, and there's Jews and there's Gentiles and all that. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Hmm, kind of like Antioch again, huh? The, the unbelieving Jews, see? In verse 3, Long time, therefore, abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony to the word of grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. So here again, the unbelieving Jews stirred them up. But what impresses me is they didn't run them out of town. They stayed there for a long time. I don't know how long that is, but it was a long time. And they stayed there speaking boldly in the Lord. Again, not Paul's words, not Paul's ideas. This is the Lord's truth. So, when you look here, you find this uh, as well. He says the multitude was divided and part held with the Jews and part held with the apostles. And when the assault was made both of the Gentiles and the Jews with the rulers to use them despitefully and stone them, he said they were aware of it and they fled to Lystra and Derby, the city of Laconia, and to the region that lies uh, round about. And there, verse 7, 
there they preach the gospel. And so you jump down here in verse number seven, and I realize you couldn't see that, but now you can. It says, and there they preach the gospel. And so there again, what, what, what were they about? They were about the gospel, about the truth of God's word. You know what? And so uh, when, we, when we think about that, we see as, as, as just a laser-like focus, laser beam focus on what's being done. They spoke boldly, and people, there was people that didn't like it, and people that did, and there's people upset, and then there was people that was happy. And you know, and I, I'll give you a little hint on this, you know that any time God's word is preached, there will be a reaction. You will either accept it or you will reject it, period. You see this here, you had people who were fighting against it, God's word, and you had people who accepted God's word. You saw it at Antioch and Pisidia. And it's all through the New Testament. It's just over and over again where you either accept or reject. There's no middle, all right? There's no in-between. Somebody says, well, I, I mean, no, I'm, I'm hearing this, but I don't know if I'm going to make a choice. You know, I don't know if I'm going to decide. Listen to me. If you don't, by, by not making a choice, you just made a choice. You know what? You can't say, oh, I'm not going to do it or whatever. You either accept or you reject. You're either for the Lord or you're against him. Now, if you're against the Lord today, you don't have to stay that way. You can repent and be for him. And sadly, those who are for him, if they're not careful, can fall and slide into that trap and you can be against the Lord. And then you have to repent of that. But you'll be in one or the other. There's not this middle ground somewhere some nebulous uh, middle ground out here of, of, of nothingness that, that people think they can abide in and they can just dwell there. And I'm just going to be in the land of indecision. No, you won't. Not with the gospel. You're going to either do it or not. And that's a fact. And so whenever, you, uh, whenever we're reading here from, from uh, the Apostle Paul and what was going on here at Iconium, then we see this... Uh, well, like I said, we see this truth. It's, it's one or the other. And you see that very, very clear in this city and even as they go to the other cities as well. Well, let's go back and go to our chart for a moment. We'll refer back to it. We talked about Paul leaving Antioch and Pisidia, and now he's come to Lyconium, or not Lyconium, but Iconium. And uh, notice what the response was. What do we find with these people? Well, we spent a lot of time on that one, hadn't we? You already know the answer. They, the response was some accepted and some rejected. The Jews, and, and again, that's what gets me, the Jews who should have been, I mean, just at his feet, in, in a manner of speaking, just all over following in multitudes going, yes, yes, this is what we've been looking forward to. And he's come already, and the Messiah has been here. They should have been excited about this and overjoyed about this. But they're the ones fighting. How ironic. And then the ones, the Gentiles here who, you know, for all practical purposes, might have just said, who are you talking about? You know, they didn't have access to all the written work like the Jews did. Uh, not all of them. So maybe a Gentile or more than one Gentile might have said, well, who are you talking about? I don't even know who this is, and I don't know if I want to listen to you or not. That might have been the normal, quote-unquote, the normal or the expected response. We got the exact opposite. We've got here the people are supposed to accept, and they're like, I don't want anything to do with that. You're crazy. And then the ones who you think would have no interest, they're the ones listening. You know what? And that teaches me something too, by the way. And I hope it teaches you a little lesson. The lesson is this. You are not qualified to decide who will or will not listen to the gospel message. That goes for me too. 
And sometimes people do that, and they say, well, I don't know if I'm going to tell so-and-so. I don't know if I'm going to tell my neighbor about it or not. You know, I don't even think they listen. Somebody says, well, I don't know if I'd tell so-and-so about it. You know you know that, uh, you know, they, they preach part-time. And then somebody else comes along. I don't know if I want to talk about that or not. You know, uh, you know, so and so and their family and this and that. and or it's it's the other side. Oh, they're so immoral. They're immoral. They do all kinds of wickedness and sin. And I mean, they just I you see them out out in their yard or wherever doing stuff and all. They're just sinners, sinners. Eh, they're not. Who gave you the the power of clairvoyance okay who gave you the power uh to decide who can and cannot or will or will not be saved i tell you who it was nobody we don't have the right to say oh this person is worthy of the and this person over and you're not worthy of my time you don't have the right to say that i don't either you know, you don't have any right to, to decide, hey, this person might listen or whatever. You don't know. And that's why the gospel is free. And that's why Christ wanted the gospel spread far and wide to who? Mark 16, verse 15. Spread far and wide to who? Every creature. Everybody. Not some, part, most, not just the ones that look like you, not just the ones in your neighborhood, not just the ones in, in your town or, or, or the ones that have your same economic status. He says to go to every creature, everybody. See, because you never know who's going to respond. And if anything, Acts 13 and 14 is teaching us that in spades. What caused them to leave town, though? Did you notice what caused them to leave town? When there was an assault made, he said, uh, both of the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers, well, they ready to stone him. That's verse number five. We're going to stone him to death. We're going to kill you. I think that might be motivation to leave town. We're going to kill you because of what you're preaching. We're going to kill you for what you've done. See? And that's, that's where, uh, where we were. They're going to enter into somewhere else next, and and that's coming up. And uh, I I got to preaching a little more than than usual, perhaps, uh, but that's okay. So we'll pick up here next time, Lord willing, and talk about uh, where they went next. And of course, you feel free to read this. Feel free to read ahead, and you'll read about them going to uh, Lystra and Derby and the things, that, and then going back again. And we're going to talk about that, okay? And so, like I said, I kind of preach a little more maybe than I, than I usually do, but uh, that's needed too. So, uh, good reminders and good things for us to, to consider and think about. Now, friends, consider your life. And if there's anything I can do to help, to encourage you, anything we can do to, to grow closer to the Lord, then let's do it. And let's be about it and, and do it today without delay. We'll come to the end of our program. And the end of our study, I'm so thankful for the fact that you have tuned in. So thankful that you're here. And again, if you have any questions at all, right there you go, CandyvilleChurchOfChrist.com. You have access to our, uh, I can't talk, our blog articles, blog. Uh, we have access to, to videos, to audio sermons, uh, radio programs, just all kinds of things that are there. We strive to update several times in the week. So there's always new material, uh, just as well on our Facebook page. Uh, there you can look us up, Caneyville Church of Christ, look us up on Facebook, and we strive to have new things there several times in the week. So there's always new stuff, new material, new things happening, and hopefully to help you, encourage you, and to challenge you that you might be what God would have you to be. Before we close, let's have a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful to thee for this day. We're so thankful for the opportunity to study so thankful for the truth we learn from this book of Acts. So thankful for all the many blessings you give us day by day. So thankful for uh, the truth. We're so thankful for the good examples we have of Paul and Barnabas and other good people and that we can learn from. And of course, the greatest example of all, Jesus Christ, and that we get to learn from him in this book and that we get to uh, follow in his footsteps. We're so thankful to thee for these many blessings for Jesus' great sacrifice. 
As you please be with us as we go from day to day that we'll live in a way that, that will be well pleased in thy sight. And pray we might grow closer to thee every day. That's all these things. In the name of thy son, Jesus. Again, I thank you very much for your time. So thankful for this opportunity we have to stay. And, and certainly wish God's blessings on each one. Hope you have a wonderful day.